The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he calls together, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It just isn't fair. Where is the justice? How can someone who has been a hell raiser all of his life, and then suddenly repents, be in line to get to heaven ahead of someone who has strived his whole life to live according to Jesus' teachings? Not only that, but there will be even more joy in heaven over this hellraiser who repents than over the good person. Isn't that what today's gospel lesson seems to say? I've heard this frustration expressed many times in the course of my life by devoted Christians, including some in my own family and Connie's family. Today's lesson from Luke is part of a trilogy of three parables by Jesus on the subject of repentance. It begins with the parable of the shepherd who loses one of his 100 sheep and he leaves the 99 and goes to look for the lost one. He rejoices when he finds it and he calls his friends and neighbors together to rejoice with him. And that's where we hear that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. We'll take a closer look at this parable in a few minutes. The second parable is the woman who loses one of her 10 coins, and she turns the house upside down looking for it until she finds it. And then she also calls together her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her. Now here we simply hear that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The third parable of this trilogy, which immediately follows these two but is not part of today's lesson, is the most familiar and perhaps the most powerful of the three, the story of the prodigal son. It ends with the father telling the older son, son, you are always with me. And all that I have, all that is mine, is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. As is usually the case with scripture lessons, context is important. The wording of today's lesson leaves us, leaves us to believe that Jesus' audience included tax collectors and sinners, but also Pharisees and scribes. The parables were a comfort to the former and a reproach to the latter. Jesus makes 
or Luke rather, makes Jesus' companionship with tax collectors a special point of interest. They include Levi or Matthew, who was one of his apostles, and Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector in Jericho, in whose home Jesus stayed in Luke 19. The sinners included any of those despised by the Pharisees for their failure to observe tithing or the ceremonial laws. And sinners also, of course, included criminals and all non-Jews. The Pharisees considered sinners lost causes. They weren't worth saving. The Pharisees and the scribes were legal experts on the law and traditions. And they insisted that everyone follow them or be considered sinners. They were what we would call today self-righteous. Luke 18 tells of Jesus himself describing them as trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. And Jesus also said that they pray by saying, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. <clears throat> in the parable of the lost sheep, when Jesus referred to the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance, he wasn't talking about people who truly didn't need repentance. Everyone needs repentance. We pray it each week in our confession. <clears throat> Jesus was referring to those Pharisees and scribes who considered themselves righteous and didn't believe that they needed repentance. They got his message and they didn't like it. There are a couple of key points in, <clears throat> in these parables that we should note. First, the seekers, whom we understand to represent God, didn't just sit back and wait for the lost to come to them. They actively went looking for the lost. And second, there was a celebration with friends and neighbors when the lost were found. In all three parables, Jesus offers that final point to the story, rejoicing over the repentant. How does God actively go looking for those who need redemption? <coughs> I think the answer should be plain to us. God came to us in the form of Jesus to bring us into the fold. How could God be more proactive than that? Jesus is the champion of those lost causes of the Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus doesn't portray God as a tyrant who demands subservience to impossible demands, but rather a God who actively seeks restoration. To quote a passage that's repeated several times in the Old Testament, he is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Jesus repeatedly talks about joy, the upside of repentance, and not about condemnation. Jesus doesn't praise the behavior of sinners, but neither does he scold nor correct them. He makes them feel, deep inside, the need to repent and to become better people. And then he welcomes them with open arms. Those who were around Jesus could feel this. And that's why so many people flocked to him. God also calls us, represented by the friends and the neighbors of the seekers in these parables, to rejoice with him when a sinner repents. We, the church, are the body of Christ in today's world, and we play an important role in this repentance and redemption process. Everyone needs the companionship and the support of fellow Christians to help us celebrate redemption and to maintain the strength to follow Jesus' teachings. We, the church, offer that fellowship. And that's one reason why participation in the church in person is so important. 
I think there's another aspect of these lessons that is sometimes overlooked. We use the words repentance and redemption, but what are the other necessary ingredients to this process that makes these things happen? Truly, those are love and forgiveness. If God didn't love us so much, it wouldn't make any difference how much we repented. Redemption wouldn't happen. And similarly, if God were not willing to forgive, there would be no redemption. So we need to expand the words in our description of this process to four, repentance, love, forgiveness, and redemption. And of course, the key to all of this is love. And love is why there is no unfairness in the redemption of that one who repents later in life. I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again. Fairness is not a part of the love equation. Love is unconditional for God, and it should be for us. The redemption process of God brings us a model for our own relationships with others. If, if God can forgive and redeem, shouldn't we follow God's lead in our own lives? The eighth step of Alcoholics Anonymous is made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. I suggest that we create a reverse step similar to this in our own lives wherein we make a list of persons that we believe have wronged us but whom we have not forgiven. And then we pray for and forgive each of them individually just as God forgives us individually. And where possible even seek personal reconciliation. All of us regularly pray the Lord's Prayer. We may not think about it, but as part of it, we make a little bargain with God. Father in heaven, if you will forgive us our sins, then we will forgive those who have wronged us. And that's not always easy. But if we truly love God, and we love our neighbors, then we'll be able to keep our end of this bargain. Amen. Amen.